We're at Pratt & Whitney Media Day and now speaking with Graham Webb, who is Vice President of the PW1000G programs, which of course the rest of the world likes to refer to as the GTF. Graham, thank you for speaking with us today. Can you give us a general update on the Pure Power program? Well, um, you know, right now, of course, we're, we're really busy and um, we're really very pleased with the overall product. Um, we're doing great with respect to our delivery. Um, we're on time, uh, which is amazing, in particular on the NEO program. Um, I think we hit delivery within days of our commitments that we made back in 2010. And also we're on spec, so you know this is kind of, for me anyway personally, the uh, culmination of many, many years from the time of the tech demonstrator uh, through all these development programs to be at this point where we're we have multiple aircraft flying. We've got uh, two NEOs flying, and we've got C six C-series uh, aircraft flying. And um, later this year, we'll see the entry into service of the, um, the NEO models, the NEO aircraft will um, come into play, uh, which will enable us to really demonstrate to the overall market uh, the value proposition that this technology uh, is bringing uh, in terms of the overall concept of introducing um, a gear turbofan engine that would enable us to use uh, advances in propulsive efficiency to drive significant changes and improvements in, in fuel burn and, and, and the overall um, emissions and noise uh, footprint uh, relative to the current generation of gas turbine engines that power commercial aircraft. So um, uh, Airbus will come into service later this year um, and we're ready. You know, we've, we're making the investments that are needed in terms of the overall uh, industrial base. Um, we're making an industrial transformation, which is phenomenal. I think you've seen that today in our facility in Milltown, where we have this marvelous uh, Durer overhead uh, horizontal assembly system, which is uh, highly automated and uh, enabling us to have the highest level of efficiency that I've ever seen in terms of how you assemble engines, get them ready to go. So um, a lot of investment in, in tooling and training um, and overall capital investment for the manufacturer of these, uh, what we call the world's best engines. So, um, you know, in, in five years, we're gonna go from where we are today, which is 800 engines, large engines, a year to over 1,800. So, <laughs> quite a bit of a ramp by 2020. And, um, you know, in addition, you know, all of the customers will be delivering these products to and making sure that they're uh, fully capable of um, taking our products and operating them uh, confidently and uh, and maintaining them in a standard that will enable them to continue to enjoy the benefits provided by the technology for many years. Uh, so overall, a lot of work, but um, this is the year when we get to see the fruits of our labors for many, many years come to fruition. So you've got the 1500, you've got the 1200, you've got the 1700, you've got the 1900. It's an incredible number of, of versions of the, of the engine. So uh, can you give us an idea of each of those and how they're pro pro sure. progressing? So, um, you know, actually when you look at it, you, you, you rattle off four um, engine numbers. And um, really when we look at it, it's, it's predominantly uh, two um, engine models and then two new installations um, of the same engines and two new aircraft. So first of all, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with uh, Bombardier. So Bombardier has the uh, PW1500 Jeep, um, which is a, a 72 inch diameter fan delivering up to uh, 24,000 pounds of thrust. So it's kind of the middle, we'll call it mama bear uh, of the fleet of GTF engines. So we have a small, a medium, and large. This is the medium one. So um, it's also the engine that we have the most experience and maturity on. Um, it was the first one that was certified back in 2013 and uh, now is powering uh, six flight test vehicles. Uh, we delivered um, 18. Uh, engines to the compliance flight test program that Bombardier is uh, currently using, uh, powering uh, five CS100 and one CS300 uh, variant. Um, each of those engines has gotten over 140 hours since uh, November of this year, so uh, Bombardier is continuing to really pick up the momentum with their flight test program. They've got uh, probably over 1,300 hours in climbing, and they're generating, uh, at this rate, probably 250 to 350 hours a month, so they're really starting to pick up speed on their overall certification program. Um, the good news is is that we're through 
the vast majority of the overall uh, aircraft, um, we'll call it uh, engineering testing or validation testing, and they're into the certification testing, which means that you know we we have the aircraft to the point where uh, we understand how it's going to perform, and we can go perform the certification testing uh, with the uh, Transport Canada uh, Air, uh, regulatory agency on the aircraft, flying the aircraft in some cases, uh, doing the test for score. And um, that, of course, in addition to a huge mountain of over 15,000 documents is enabling the aircraft to achieve its type certificate, which will occur this year. And then we're off to entering the service on that program. So uh, a lot of effort uh, collectively from the Bombardier team and our team and all of the other suppliers. And we're all unified to make sure that it happens. So that's the Bombardier program. Um, the one thing I'll state on this is that uh, it is the leader. Um, it's the most mature engine that we have in the overall fleet. And we take all the learning that we get through the flight test program and the engine test program, and we immediately funnel it down into the other variants of the engines to ensure that the next time they're even smoother. So um, on to Mitsubishi. So Mitsubishi, um, uh, we'll call it the M-Jet, the Mitsubishi Regional Jet. Uh, has the PW1200G, so that is the smallest variant of our engine, gear turbofan engine family. Uh, 17,000 pounds thrust is the uh, maximum rating on that aircraft. Uh, Mitsubishi actually was the, the first uh, airframer to select the gear turbofan technology, so we have kind of a soft spot in our heart for them um, as a result of being the, the company that kind of kicked it all off. Uh, we've delivered uh, four engines to Mitsubishi currently that are what we'll call compliance engines that have been installed on to two of their uh, flight test vehicles. Um, we've recently completed all of the engine and cell validation testing that's required for us to uh, enable the uh, propulsion system to be declared safe for flight, and uh, that will enable the um, uh, Mitsubishi regional jet guys to get the aircraft up in the air later this year. So. We're really excited for yet another flight test program that's to come, and um, you know we have a large team of people that's in Nagoya, Japan, and for you those who watch this video, I mean, we're thanking them every day for all of the efforts they're making uh, or, or, or providing uh, to ensure that uh, our, our next program is successful. Um, we'll be, um, we're also on the same side uh, working the development activities and the certification activities for that engine will certify the engine uh, next year. So a lot of work on the Mitsubishi side. Um, in terms of the Embraer programs, so we have, um, as I stated, we have two um, engines that are derivatives of the 1500, which powers the E190 and the E195, so that's the first one out of the box. And then we have the smaller variant, which is the E175 uh, E2, which is powered by a derivative of the 1200. So. The 1900G is the derivative of the 1500. Um, that engine's going to start testing this year, here, uh, here in a few months. Uh, first engine to test with um, the unique uh, elements uh, for the Embraer installation, which is externals and some uh, modifications to the environmental uh, or the engine build unit. Um, that will then go into a flight test program in the summer. Uh, we're going to deliver our first. Um, flight compliance engines to Embraer that they'll subsequently install on the first aircraft and hand over to the flight test program uh, later this year. So that program is also going to get up into a flight test program here really shortly. Did, did you say that the Embraer will get the compliance engine in 2015? Yes, yes. We will deliver our first two compliance engines this year. That's very early for their for the program, right? Um, I would say it's, I mean, not that early. I mean, it's, um, you know, if you look at the engines, okay, we obviously have them already certified. We, right. We're working in production with them, and so the modifications are pretty minor. Um, I have to say this: you know, the Embraer guys have done a phenomenal job in getting their aircraft uh, design up and ready, and the manufacturing uh, to put together the aircraft. So, um, you know, it's I would say, you know, it's maybe a little fast, but um, you know, nonetheless, probably in line with you know, what we've seen from other guys. And. Um, the 1700, uh, which we put onto the E175, is, is now uh, entering into what we call the preliminary design phase. We're working with Embraer um, on interfaces and installation, so uh, a bit further down the path, and it will enter into service a couple of years after the, the 190 and uh, the year after the 195 uh, enters into service. So kind of a relative timing. You've got one that's kind of entering, it's, it's through the critical design phase, and, and uh, 
entering into the validation phase for both the engine and the aircraft. And then the second is the, um, the 175, which is in a preliminary design phase and is a couple of years off from getting into the same state as the, as the 1900 is. So that's kind of an overview of all of the programs I have the responsibility of. Okay, so I think you didn't you didn't uh, mention anything there on on the Neo. Oh well, the Neo I can talk about the Neo. So the Neo um, has uh, it's obviously certified. We certified late last year. Um, we've been delivering uh, flight compliance engines. Uh, so we have um, four um, engines in place that are now powering uh, Neo flight compliance uh, aircraft. Uh, that program is going very well. It uh, is operating smoothly. There's a lot of the benefits of the, uh, the other programs that we have that have been rolled into it. Uh, first production engines are coming down the line. Um, and the other thing I'll point out is that um, we're doing um, what we'll call service-ready endurance uh, engine testing uh, on the NEO engines. And so we've got a couple of engines, uh, one which is a full-up propulsion system with an nacelle, uh, which will be used uh, in order to run a lot of cyclic exposure and learn out uh, failure modes uh, that may occur in service earlier so that we can understand that. And then we have a, another engine that's going to be tested in a, at an undisclosed location, but one at which that has uh, high ambient temperatures, um, a high dust content, and also a high level of pollution. So uh, this rainbow uh, of, of turbine and combustor uh, coatings and cooling schemes will be used to enable us to evaluate some different designs and test their uh, robustness against these adverse environments so that we can uh, make appropriate choices for uh, long-term production to ensure that the engine is uh, delivering the reliability that we want. Uh, we'll also test out all of the line replaceable units in those harsh environments and, and learn from that as well. Um, other than that, it's all about uh, flight test and entering to service preparation. So um, one of the things we're doing the flight test programs for both the C-Series and the NEO is that um, we have uh, what we call roving representatives. These are, um, are some of our most experienced uh, field mechanics, uh, flight test representatives, not flight test, but uh, field reps that uh, we're putting into the flight test program, uh, co-located with uh, our flight test crews. And, and these guys are um, supporting the flight test mechanics most of whom are very ingenious and might not necessarily follow the manual, but we have people who are used to training and following rigorously our operational manuals that are working side by side with our flight test crews as we identify um, uh, autumns and maintenance uh, issues and providing us feedback uh, in our electronic data systems that we have established, um, feeding it back to our global command center here located in East Hartford and really proving out the overall system. Um, so these guys are, uh, you know, finding things that, um, you know, are enabling us to enhance the design, things that the flight test mechanics might not recognize, like, okay, when I take this tube off, it drips oil all over me, so put a little trap in here so that I can drain the fluid before I take the part off, and that way I, I won't soak myself in oil that a flight test mechanic might not highlight to people. So that type of feedback is being provided. Uh, through our systems to our global command center where it's then fed to the engineering organization and then they're being able to take action to improve the overall maintenance experience uh, for entry into service. Um, those guys, those, those reps that are on the flight test program will then be placed uh, with our initial entry into service customers to uh, basically flow the latest and greatest knowledge um, from the flight test program into those launch customers for uh, training and knowledge and experience to ensure that the entry into service uh, experience for those customers is um, the best possible. So it's a bit of a change we've made to our organizational approach, um, which we think will help our entry into service go even better than what we would have done uh, previously. It seems to me that with so many programs going at once and having all these people together, you must be building an enormous amount of uh, experience already that you can drive down as you point to uh, to when you get to launch customers. 2015 sounds like a huge year for your company. Yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you ready? Well, I mean, obviously we've been planning for this for many, many years. And so, um, you know, I feel extremely confident that we have the capabilities of doing this. I mean, we've talked about 
Um, you know, back in 2007, you know, we made a lot of commitments and we said, watch us do it. We've delivered on those commitments. So um, we're on time, we're on spec. Um, production is ready. The facilities are in place. We're ramped up and moving. We've got the assembly lines installed in Middletown and West Palm Beach. We have all of the new uh, automated uh, factories uh, going up. We've revamped our test cells. Um, we've brought on and strengthened, you know, brought on new and strengthened our supply relationships. Um, we have all of our logistics in place. Um, the NEO will enter into service this year. We're going to execute all these flight test programs. And, you know, we know that the engines provide great value to our customers. I mean, we've got testing and, and, and real hardware that proves the fact that the engines are delivering the fuel burn, they're delivering the noise, it's delivering the, the emissions capabilities. We've got 16,000 hours of testing, uh, 31,000 cycles, and over 3,500 hours in climbing and flight testing uh, to enable us to have the confidence to our 60 customers and 30, 30 customers or 30 different countries to uh, ensure that we're going to deliver the value we promised. So the engine is, is and based on all the data you have right now, what, what the market should be expecting is the engine is at spec or better than spec, as some of some some sources are saying. Let's just say that it will be at, if not slightly better. Okay. Last question. Obviously, with this kind of foundation, one has to be looking at what comes next. Are you is Pratt prepared to talk yet about a larger thrust GTF? Well, you know, let me just put it this way: is that um, we have a lot of discussions with. Uh, wide variety of air freight customers all the time. And, and we have discussed larger variants of the gear turbofan engine. We certainly have the capability to deliver a larger variant. Um, I think our focus in terms of the future is putting the technologies in place. Um, we have concepts uh, in terms of next generation, uh, we'll call it the Gen 2 um, engine architecture that we've defined. Um, and we've identified the technologies that would support that. That engine architecture is scalable across a wide range of uh, thrust classes, from single aisle all the way up to wide body. And you know, really at this point, it's all about well, what's the next great opportunity for us to be able to take the technologies we're developing, put it into this new uh, Gen 2 architecture, and then you know, go deliver additional value to uh, customers and, and to Brad Whitney. And so, when that opportunity comes around, and you know, we'll see ourselves put together a new product, and off we'll go. Any, any, anywhere on, on this is, I promise you this is the last one, anywhere that you think that the technology of gears tops out in thrust? No. Um, the, the, the gear itself is fully scalable. Um, it's all a matter of keeping the, the you know, basically the stresses, the, the, the things that, you, when you look at it, it doesn't matter how much thrust you're generating, it matters what's the, the stress on the, on the gear teeth, um, what's the sliding frictional forces. And so that's what we do. We keep ourselves within our known boundaries and we can scale that gear up to whatever size it's required. And actually, on wide bodies, um, it does perform better. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easier concept than what we've already delivered. Thank you. Thank you.